far as just how do we explain <coughs> regions that have lots and lots of languages versus regions that just have a few. Um, but then there's the diversity of, of like families or genealogical genetic units, and that's a slightly different question, right? So, and if you think about the processes that lead to this diversity, there are different processes that might be implicated. So, diversity of languages, this involves you know, presumably processes of diversification or splitting or cladogenesis. Um, it's more agnostic to the, about the degree to which those languages are maintained over time. Um, the diversity of genealogical units, so like we saw in the Amazon, here there's more agnostic. On some level there must be diversification clearly, but uh, for periods of time it may be more agnostic about the degree of splitting that's taking place, but it's emphasizing maintenance. So like we see in the Amazon, many, many of these language families, there's not a lot of evidence for internal diversification, but there is evidence for long-term maintenance of these units. And then from a psychological perspective, of course, we have patterns of, of what people like McEvans have, have distinguished from diversity with respect to languages and families, and called disparity, meaning um, typological difference across linguistic systems. And as we've seen, these different, these different ways of understanding diversity can uh, overlap and cross-cut each other. So like in the Valpez and parts of Amazonia, you've got a lot of diversity of language families, maybe somewhat less diversity of languages, and maybe even less, in certain regions at least, diversity with respect to psychological disparity. Um, <clears throat> so, in thinking about uh, the processes of contact and and diversity and how and diversification and maintenance and how those all intersect with each other, it's important to, to think about these variables a little bit separately. Um, in terms of thinking about what kinds of processes of change are, that are associated with language contact might be relevant, um, we can think of change, contact-driven change applying at various levels of linguistic structure. And as we saw yesterday, sometimes in very different ways, right? So for example, in the Balfez, less change on the level of lexical form, but quite a bit of change on the level of morphosyntactic structure, for example. Um, and we can also think about continua relating to both convergence and divergence, such that in convergence you can go from uh, limited borrowing, which would be relatively very little convergence, all the way to language shift, which would be sort of absolute convergence. Um, in processes of divergence, you can go from maintenance all the way to splitting, right? So from very little, virtually no divergence to lots of divergence. Um, on the technological level, we can have continuing in both of these domains towards greater or lesser disparity. So again, I think it's useful to think of these as somewhat different parameters that may or may not converge in different situations. <coughs> so as far as thinking about the factors that are relevant to these processes, um, again, I think there are quite a lot of possible factors that may be implicated. So, um, in terms of what's actually happening to the languages, of course, we have issues of structure um, and uh, linguistic similarity and so on that we've addressed a little bit. But just in terms of what's happening in the dynamics of multilingual contexts and in the behavior of multilingual individuals and the kinds of, um, of effects on the languages that may arise from those behaviors and those dynamics, um, again, we can think of those in terms of of phenomena that may be um, more socially culturally relevant, socioculturally relevant. So here, this isn't really meant to be a continuum. This is just meant to be two categories that are relatively likely to be more relevant <coughs> to sociocultural phenomena and those that are more relevant to sort of cognitive, what we would imagine to be more like cognitive universals. And again, there are a variety of of phenomena that come into play. So we talked about the, the yesterday we talked a bit about the, the phenomenon of cognitive economy. You're balancing two languages. You have you know a certain um, there's a certain cognitive load that that involves, and that, that that cognitive load can work together with social expectations about how those languages may be balanced to translate into particular kinds of effects. Um, and then the point also that we talked about yesterday is that 
that some domains may be more, some linguistic domains may be more accessible to conscious manipulation on the part of speakers than others. Um, there's some really interesting work by Ellison and Michelli about the avoidance of um, words in, in, on the part of bilinguals who are managing two, for example, two separate languages. Um, and the uh, avoidance of words that are similar between those languages that might actually drive diversification um, rather than convergence in a complex situation. Um, and then on the more socioculturally relevant level, we've got some of the things that we've already talked about. So discursive frequency and relevance, um, social network structures, and um, some, of, some of the points that I was emphasizing yesterday, the perceptions of, of uh, social solidarity and difference and how language is, is understood in those terms. So um, I think the point here is that there, there are a number of different kinds of processes that may be involved. Some like them to be more universal, some like them to be more variable, and then there's the intersections of these processes that relate to how um, contact of a change may actually play out in different situations. So again, my focus is really more on the sociocultural side of these things, but thinking about their intersection with these other variables as well. Um, so LePage and Tabaret Keller, of course, have a very, uh, now very classic book about um, the perceptions of identity and how those relate to linguistic choices. And they point out that uh, individuals will shape their linguistic behavior um, with respect to social groups that they wish to be identified with. And their main point is that this can be a, a very flexible negotiation, but I think that's a point that is relevant to different situations. Different social and cultural contexts may allow more or less flexibility in that regard. So some of the things that may vary, how the social group is understood in relation to others, the degree to which individuals are able to manipulate their affiliations and, and the role that language plays in, them, in that process. So these are things that we see varying across different contexts. So from that perspective, we can ask questions like how do the dynamics of convergence and divergence vary across different multilingual contexts? Um, how do these dynamics relate to the way people see the relationship between social group and language? And how we get these contexts varying as well as their dynamics across global regions and across time periods. So one of the points that I'll come back to toward the end is that even in the same place with the same individuals, you can have historic, different, different contexts that may be historically relevant in different ways. Um, so for example, local indigenous context versus colonial overlays, and these may have very different contact outcomes relating to the languages involved. Um, so ultimately, how do these differences translate into different contact related changes? Um, so I think an important caveat here is that we have to be very 
But in fact, other work, such as work by Bauer and um, by Hardy, has shown that those are actually fairly exceptional cases. Also, Patrick McConville, um, that these cases of very high lexical borrowing appear to be fairly exceptional. And that in general, it seems that lexical borrowing is fairly low. Um, Mark Harvey's 2014 paper uh, is, is a really interesting exploration of some of the historical context behind some of the borrowing that's taken places in these languages. And he argues that um, a lot of the lexical borrowing that's taken place, in the cases of relatively intense lexical borrowing, these can be attributed to um, relatively weak social ties in those regions. So places where people have lots of connections, but not particularly strong connections with other groups. So he argues that that kind of scenario facilitates lexical borrowing. But interestingly, he also says that a lot of those weak social ties were, were uh, they were, a lot of the social ties that were present in the region were weakened in the early colonial period, and that a lot of the intensity of the lexical borrowing actually is a post-colonial phenomenon. So all in all, I think that, um, that the parallels between Northern Australia and Amazonia are maybe a little higher than we might imagine from East Coast, for example, and that it does seem that lexical borrowing on the whole has been fairly low. Um, and there's some evidence for uh, structural diffusion, um, although this is an area that I think probably needs more work. So what else is going on in Australia? One difference that seems to be particularly interesting between uh, Australia and Amazonia is that in Australia there seems to be more of an emphasis on the association between language and land. So in Amazonia this is relevant to a certain degree, but not, it's not very strong. In my experience, at least, it's not very strong, at least in the areas that I'm familiar with. Um, so we have quotes like this one from Evans. In this system, your clan language is your title deed, establishing your claims to your own country, your spiritual safety, and luck in the hunt there. Um, so uh, I think this came up in the discussion in Ian's class the other day, but uh, in Australia, it seems that if you go to another area, you will first speak the language of that area, and then maybe you'll switch to your own language or something in the interest of, of smooth communication. But you'll first you'll initiate your interaction by speaking the language of that region in order to show that your, your respect for, for your hosts and, and recognition of the association between language and land. In traditional, uh, the traditional pattern in the Valpets, it's the opposite. You go to another place, in, at least among sort of like the Tuganoan context, for example, uh, Tuganoans who would go to another community would start out by speaking their own language and then assimilate to the community language. Of course, as we saw yesterday with Kupta, it's a little different, which presumably has to do with the social imbalance. So lots of complexities, but nevertheless, this seems to be this distinction between land, the relationship between language and land is something that seems to be more relevant in Australia than in Amazon. Another point that comes up in the literature, uh, so Harvey's work, for example, is that there was code switching in pre-colonial Australia, as far as he's been able to determine, um, and that it had an important social function in, as he puts it, signaling shifts in the rights and obligations that an individual wished to form around in each interaction. So this is more like a social negotiation of your um, relationships with other people and the kinds of claims that you might make to by those relationships. So, for example, access to resources in the territory that your mother comes from, something like that. Um, and that language has an important role in signaling your claim to those rights and obligations. Um, again, this is somewhat different from Amazonia, where your, your, your language choice is more rigidly patrilectal. Um, at least, Northwest Amazonia. Um, and finally, in Northern Australia, uh, Harvey and others uh, point out that, that there may be some actual diversification that's, that's um, fostered by the, these kinds of social shifts. So, in many ways, in Northern Australia's uh, linguistic, map of linguistic diversity looks a bit like what we see in Amazonia, um, but there are certain differences in the dynamics. So, if we try to use this diagram again to represent how those play out, um, 
it seems that there's a, the difference from Amazonia is that there's a little bit more of a relationship between um, personal identification with other languages in addition to the one that you would consider more your own. So that seems one variable that's a little bit different. Um, even though the, the map itself, in terms of lots of unrelated language families, um, at least in, in sort of rough visualization, looks fairly similar. <coughs> Um, okay, let's look at northern Vanuatu. So, here's another example of a really multilingual region. Um, so this is drawing primarily on Alex Francois's work, where he points out that in this area you've got, um, you know, fewer than 10,000 people, but 17 distinct languages, um, but all of them, or most of them, quite closely related. So, Oceanic, Austronesian. He does talk a little bit about a couple of Papuan languages in there as well, but um, maybe outside of this immediate area. Um, so he talks about how he emphasizes, first of all, he emphasizes the egalitarian relationship among these communities, which, um, as Nina pointed out in Dagestan, and as I have pointed out for Amazonia, isn't always the case in multilingual areas of stable multilingualism. It's not necessarily a prerequisite for stable multilingualism, but it does seem to be a common factor. Um, so he talks about how uh, linguistic diversity is anchored in the emblematic function of language, which is also something that's discussed in the Amazonian context. So he says it sealed each community's anchoring in social and geographic space. So both social relationships and land relationships. And he emphasizes this idea of egalitarian multilingualism. Um, here's an example from Francois's work of, of, um, of structural isomorphism but lexical difference. So he argues that given the relatively close relationship among these languages, we might expect to find more similarities in lexicon than we find, but that the, the structural isomorphism is almost complete. So he's basically saying there's evidence that it looks like there's maybe lexical differentiation, but um, you know, grammatical convergence, or at least lack of grammatical divergence, or disparity. So a point that he emphasizes, is he says, if an innovation does emerge, it will spread quickly to the point where there's a specific perception of a community boundary. So in other words, within a given group that understands itself to be a social unit, there's rapid spread of this innovation, rapid homogenization, we could say, but that when it meets some sort of social boundary, it stops there. And that will, uh, of course, increase the distance between that social community and, and the, increase the linguistic difference between that community and the next ones over. Um, so, what, how do we think about this in terms of, um, in comparison to the other regions and in terms of, of Enfield's schema? Um, one thing that's interesting here is that the languages are already quite similar. So, on some level, it seems that there may not be a radical disconnect between the processes of diversification that you get in a place like Vanuatu and the kind of maintenance without diversification that you get in Amazonia. But one difference might just be, what's your starting point? So in Amazonia, you already have, as, as I pointed out yesterday, there's evidence that, or we can imagine at least, that um, a lot of those distinctions may have been formed in an earlier period before there was as much uh, demographic density and intensive interaction. But that when that demographic density filled in and the intensive interaction got underway, that um, those distinctions were just maintained. Or maybe the distinctions came about through similar processes and for less higher density in the past, but then were maintained from there. Um, in this case, the languages are all clo pretty closely related, so you might imagine that there's sort of similar processes of establishing social groups uh, on the basis of language, um, but that in this case, those distinctions have to be more actively created rather than being distinctions that are already very salient and that are in place. Um, but as far as, as the processes that are involved, we can think about this as, as an association between this language spoken by people like me 
and a language that's not entirely different, that's also, but that's spoken by people <coughs> who are not like me. And so, therefore, this will allow processes of diversification to, to play out relatively rapidly and lead to the, the extensive diversity that we see. Um, we can compare contexts like this to um, Samoa, for example, where um, Henry Spears Kiergarten has been working with Nick Evans' group in, um, at ANU. And an interesting contrast here is that in Samoa, you also have an Oceanic Austronesian language. Um, you also have an island environment. As I understand it, the, the, the scale is not that much different. Um, but in Samoa, you have almost no diversification. So it's a really interesting contrast here in Okinawa. Intensive diversification and so uh, very little. Murray Gard has also worked on in within Vanuatu, pointing out that some regions in, are undergoing very intensive diversification and other regions much less. So even within Vanuatu, there's variation to the degree to which these processes are in play. Um, so I would argue that it must have a, an enormous amount to do with this conception of <coughs> who speaks what and how that is relevant to indicate. Uh, so one more region, so the grassfield area of Cameroon, um, and particularly the lower Fulgum region in, that Jeff Good and Pierre Paolo Di Carlo have worked in. Um, so here they emphasize the high linguistic diversity in this region, um, but again, mostly within one, one uh, you know, a set of genetically related languages, so in this case, um, Zantoid languages. Um, their work and work by other people who have written about the same general area stresses the high levels of multilingualism in the region and uh, the frequent intermarriage that takes place there among speakers of different languages. Um, they also emphasize that there's not very much code mixing that goes on. So it looks a bit like the Amazonian situation. Um, but uh, and, and they also talk about multilingualism as a kind of uh, as socially relevant in driving lexical diversification. Um, but again, there's certain differences here compared to the Amazonian context and some of the other areas in that this really interesting work by Pierre Paolo Di Carlo and by Jeff Good and Pierre Paolo uh, talks about how multilingualism in this region is much more negotiable than, for example, what we see in Amazonia. And somewhat different from what we what I've read about in Australia as well. So here people are understood to be affiliated with multiple networks, multiple social networks, and that their multilingual multilingualism, their uses of different languages allows them to signal their affiliations with those different networks. <coughs> Again, not totally unlike what we saw in Australia with respect to um, use of different languages as signaling different rights and obligations that are associated with different different social networks in this case, or more specifically different regions in the Australian case. So, do you call good right that language is conceptualized as an index of group identity, but that the social identity is relatively fluid? So again, this is, seems a bit different from the Amazonian situation, where your identity, your social identity is more, is more fixed. As, as we saw yesterday, maybe not completely fixed, but more fixed. Um, so, again, attempting to uh, schematize this, maybe one way to think about it in terms of Enfield's diagram is an association between a given language and your social group, but also your social affiliation and another. So in other words, your social affiliation can be associated with multiple languages. Um, so that's, that's an effort to look at some of these different regions and think about the variables that are in play and try to compare them a little bit. There's a huge amount of more of this sort of work that I think needs to be done. So this is really just a start. Um, and I'm sure that those of you who know more about some of these other regions will probably have some really interesting um, points to bring up related to this comparison. Um, okay, so that's that's pretty much all I'm going to do right now as far as comparing across different regions. But uh, I'd also like to 
talk a little bit about how we might compare across different time periods um, and different, different sort of historically anchored contexts. So this also relates to the question of historical inference. So what do we do when we have a given language and we want to try to understand where it comes from with respect to being shaped by contact? So um, you know, there's many examples of cases where people are in doubt about the genetic affiliation of a particular language um, because it draws from multiple sources. And one can debate which of those sources is primary, what were the historical processes as far as inheritance versus diffusion that would have led to the, the picture that we see attested in this language today. We don't have, in many cases, we don't have much information about what happened historically. <coughs> Um, and then the other issue that I want to talk more about, particularly with coming back to the Belt Pest context, is, um, but also, you know, it's relevant in many, many situations, is what about distinctions between local indigenous multilingual contexts and colonial contexts that may be overlaid on that. Um, so this is relevant. And you know, I was talking about this with Dagestan, it's relevant in many parts of the world. So, um, First, I'll look a little bit at, at, we can look a little bit at languages that have been shaped by radical contact events. So here, my focus is coming back to Amazonia, but these questions are all in many other parts of the world as well. Um, so here, there, I'm going to look at a couple examples of, of languages where there's clearly been radical alteration through contact, but it's unclear what that involves. So here's an interesting case, Kukama and Amagua. These are two Tupi Guarani languages. Um, and this is work by Love Michael and his colleagues. <coughs> um, so the Tupi Guarani language family is distributed more or less as these, these, these packets of color um, indicate. So this is from a map by, uh, in, in, from Love Michael's work. So this is a 16th century distribution of Tupi Guarani languages and distributions. Um, so the languages themselves are the black dots, and then the, um, the colored areas are languages of particular branches of Tupi Guarani, particular spreads. Um, <coughs> Kokama and Amago, you can see, are spoken all the way up in the western um, part of the Amazon basin. So they're the only Tupi Guarani languages that are attested in this northwestern area, other than Nina um, Tuwili Mujerao, which was basically a form of Tupinamba, the language spoken along the coast that was then brought by Jesuit missionaries into other parts of the Amazon basin as a contact language. Um, but uh, Lev's work and his colleagues has pointed out that Kukama and Amagua and Tupi Guarani are a subgroup within, or sorry, Kukama, Amagua, and Tupinamba are a subgroup within Tupi Guarani. So the argument is that. They would have broken off from uh, from Tupinamba, which is the antecedent of, of Nina Tuwili Mujeral. So that's the blue, the blue shape here. Uh, Kukama and Amara would have broken off from them, gone out to the Amazon. At some point later, the Europeans would have arrived, taken Tupinamba, and brought it uh, more inland as this contact variety, which then, of course, became quite different from Tupinamba, um, or somewhat different. But the question is, what happened to Kokama and Amagua? Um, so, some evidence that these languages were radically altered by contact um, includes things like evidence of frozen morphology. So, here in this first example, the word for laugh in, uh, I, I actually didn't indicate whether this was Kokama or Amagua or both, I'm not sure, but one or the other or both of those languages, um, I believe both. Uh, and there's evidence that there's, there's a frozen first-person active prefix that is no longer morphologically active. Um, they also point out that 20% of the lexicon of proto kokama Omagwa, which themselves are two closely related sisters, has a non tupi Guarani origin. But other than a couple of Arawak, probably Vanda Kurtzer, there's no it's not clear what the source of that lexical material is. So, you know, we've already seen Western Amazon is full of isolates. It's very plausible that they that this material comes from a language that's no longer attested and has no attested relatives, so its source can't be determined 
um, but it's not it's not clear what happens from it. <coughs> um, <coughs> so what's the story about Pocama and Amagua? Work by Anasoli Cabral in the 90s and some subsequent work argued that it was a post-contact Creole. Then she was focusing on Pocama. So in her work on Pocama, she argues that it's a post-contact Creole that arose in Jesuit missions. However, in work by Love Michael and Zachary O'Hagan, they began working with what are essentially the last couple of speakers of Amagua, which used to be, as you can see from this, this map, used to be a very widely distributed language along the whole uh, upper part of the Amazon River, very, very powerful, very demographically numerous, but um, has now been reduced to just a couple of speakers. <coughs> um, in this work that they've been doing on Omago, they've determined that this contact is, is evident in, these contact effects are evident in both languages and that can, the, the, the source of the contact can therefore be assumed to have occurred um, prior to the split of the two languages. And that moreover, that the historical records relating to the Jesuit missions indicate that creolization of these languages in that context probably did not occur. So they argue that this con these contact effects are older. They're not a post-colonial um, phenomenon. Um, so they argue that, they, Lev Michael has a really interesting argument that he proposes that Proto-Kokama Omagua probably involved a kind of semi-creolization that had to do with when these people arrived in this area and established this massive dominance, there are, there's historical evidence that they assimilated huge numbers of captives from surrounding groups. So historical evidence that they were, they were raiding groups continuously, assimilating captives, and in the context of these societies, the Tupigorni societies, the assimilation of captives did not mean that they were t living as totally subjugated slaves. It meant that they were essentially being incorporated into the social structures of the communities and becoming, if not full-fledged, semi-full-fledged members of the communities. <clears throat> in other words, but assimilated to the point that they were thought of as members of the family to a degree. Um, so he argues that if we put all this evidence together, that one plausible explanation for this contact, these contact effects has to do with this massive incorporation of captives resulting in radical changes to the languages uh, that would have followed the arrival of the Kukama and Amagua in the upper Amazon, but predated the colonial um, arrival. So this would be an example where um, we have pretty radical contact effects on the language, um, but I would argue that it's still consistent with the kind of picture that I drew yesterday of, um, of contact effects that don't involve kind of active shift on the part of groups. So if you're being assimilated as captives, it's not exactly a, a choice that you're making relating to language shift. Um, <clears throat> so an interesting example of radical change. Anybody have questions right now? Okay, we'll look at another, uh, another example. So this is a slightly different example. Um, again, if we look around the Amazon Basin and say, what, what examples do we have of radical contact languages that are a little bit different from the kind of scenario that I painted yesterday of you know, maintenance in place of languages in multilingual contexts with grammatical convergence? What different scenarios do we find? The Kukama Amago case is one. Um, another case is pigeonized forms of Carib languages um, that have been attested beginning in the 1650s and all the way up through the 20th century. So we have evidence of pigeon Carib, pigeon Wayana, which is another Carib language, it's a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> and another interesting one, a trio Njuka pigeon. So Njuka is actually um, a English-based Creole that was spoken by um, by uh, enslaved African people in the Great Guianas and became the dominant language in um, maroon communities, so communities that were formed by people who escaped from slavery and formed communities in the, um, in the interior and often interacted very closely with indigenous populations. So there's a, this interesting trio in Kuka Pigeon where about two-thirds of the lexicon is trio and about a third comes from this English-based Creole 
Um, but Peter Becker and other people have written about these, these pigeons. Um, pigeon Carib and Pigeon Wayana, the lexicon is almost entirely Carib, but there's arguments that they have they're pigeonized. Um, <clears throat> so some of the examples for, or some of the reasons for, some of the arguments for claiming that they're pigeons, for example, um, in contrast to the complexity that you get in Carib verbs, you don't have any verbal inflection for the most part in these varieties. Um, you get possessive constructions involve full possessive pronouns, like this example here with the hammock. Um, whereas in Carib languages, you have phenomenal prefixes. So these are some of the examples for, or some some of the evidence for saying that these are our pigeons. Um, so again, it's another question. So if you have indigenous context contexts or indigenous contexts involving multilingualism in contact, to what extent do we have evidence of these emerging as pigeons? Well, in this case, it appears that this could be attributed to um, that these pigeons probably arose in the context of a Carib-dominated trading network that would have been related to the arrival of um, people of European and African descent. So I would argue that these pigeons are probably not, probably didn't arise within the indigenous context. They probably arose uh, through these trading networks that were very, very important in this region. Um, I don't know that we'll ever have a definitive answer to that because we don't have a time machine. Um, but I, I think that's probably the explanation. So again, it would probably make sense to think of these, these radical contact varieties in this, in this area as post-colonial conventions. Um, another example of, of uh, languages that have been radically influenced by contact um, Quechua and Aymara. So these are both two shallow language groups spoken in the Andean region. So here we're moving out of the Amazon basin. Um, <coughs> but from, for example, from Bruce Manheim's work, it appears that the Andes was likely to have been oh, as probably as linguistically diverse as Amazonia before the Inca expansion and before the Spanish intervention. So a lot of what we see in the Andes now, where it looks more linguistically homogeneous with respect to big family spreads, is probably quite recent. Um, but as far as what happened to shape these two major languages that are present there now, um, the question of the relationship between Quechua and Aymara has been debated for a long time. So they have a lot in common. Um, at the, currently, Quechua is much more widely spread, but Aymara has a big presence in the north. And there are a few uh, related Aymara languages, at least one that's a little bit further north, um, that's a little bit more distinct than, so there's a little bit more depth in Aymara than there is in Quechua. Um, they share about 20% of core vocabulary, so that seems like quite a lot. And their grammatical structures are very, very similar. So here's an example of those similarities. Um, and also you see a couple of lexical similarities in there as well. Um, but really, almost isomorphic grammatical structures. So th these similarities have given rise to various claims that Quechua and Aymara are related languages. But in the assessments by Mouskin and Adelar and others, they're probably not genetically related. They just don't share enough of the kind of core vocabulary and, and core morphology that you might expect. Um, <clears throat> so, as, of course, as I talked about earlier this morning, there does seem to be a lot of turnover in Bell and morphology, so I guess there's some questions there um, with respect to Amazonian languages. But at any rate, there doesn't appear to be solid evidence that these are genetically related. Um, and so, Mouskin and others have argued that the shared vocabulary and shared forms is probably Loaned. And that the grammatical structures, the, the grammatical isomorphism is also probably a complex effect. Did you have a question oh, Could you please go to the previous slide showing the sure. isomorphism? Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I have a problem with this particular slide because uh -huh. um, I, would, well, I would claim that if one can actually pick a more or less random language around the world and substitute it, well, 
substituted for either of Kecha mm. and Aymara. Mm. And structure might be quite similar because but this particular example shows almost none of the peculiarities of these languages. Mm. So I would wonder if something more intricate would also be isomorphic to such a degree. Yeah, okay, that's a very good point. I took this from Mouskin's work, but uh, probably a more judicious choice of examples would have been in order. Probably the only, the only Ketra and Mara specialty in these examples are the second position thing close mm -hmm. to Yeah, sure, because you have the closet initial pronoun, you have your final word order, you have verbal inflection. Um, yeah, I take your point. Um, well, you can go back and look at Moskin's work and other people's work for maybe better uh, arguments that there's a, grammatical, a lot of grammatical similarity. Um, but yeah, it's a good point that this example isn't as illustrated as it might be. Um, but if you, if you look at their work, you see that, that these similarities, the, the kinds of similarities you see here are pervasive. Yeah, thank you. Um, Okay, so Moskin has a, uh, a paper from 2012 where he, he engages with this question, what happens with Quechua and Aymara? Um, you know, can we really argue against genetic relationship and what kind of contact relationship can we propose as an alternative? Um, <clears throat> and he argues in favor of an ancient contact relationship that would have predated the spread of Quechua over this really large geographic area. So he argues that this probably occurred um, when Quechua and Aymara were relatively small groups and you know, presumably adjacent, um, we would assume adjacent. Um, and, but he, he points out that there's two options for, to explain where these, you know, to explain how we could get this, this grammatical congruence in particular. Um, one possibility is that there would have been a shift uh, with substrate effects such that um, Aymara would have shifted to um, this pre-Quechua, and that Quechua would have been altered on the model of Aymara um, through that shift. Um, the other possibility is that Quechua could have been, that there could have been contact between these groups with significant um, restructuring, much like what we see in, for example, Hupin Tucano or Teriana, and, um, and uh, <clears throat> um, Teriana and Tupano, where there would be grammatical isomorphism that came about through um, intense contact, um, but wouldn't necessarily have involved shift um, of, a, of, a, of a whole social group or a whole group of speakers to another language. Um, so he tentatively favors the idea that Keto was restructured on the Aymara mold, not involving shift. But he points out that the, the choice between these two is really quite up in the air. Um, I would say that on the basis of what we see in more contemporary contact zones, like the Upper Guinea and other regions that we talked about yesterday, um, the more recent evidence of, or the more recent uh, cases of, of um, multilingual interactions in Amazonia, in indigenous Amazonia, might also point us towards the catch restructuring uh, choice rather than the shift choice, but it's an open question. Maybe this is a case that was, um, maybe this is an exceptional example of shift. So yesterday I was saying I don't see any uh, clear cases of shift that is not colonially mediated involving indigenous Amazonian languages, but obviously the further we get back in the past, the more of a question this, this is. We don't have the, the tools to tell. Um, so here the question is, is open. But if I had to put money on it, I would bet for convergence rather than shifts, which appears to be Moscow's choice as well. Yeah. I have a question about this uh, idea that there was a certain convergence in a uh, highly localizable area and then spread, if, if I understood the mm -hmm. explanation correctly. So first uh, question is uh, whether the spread involves the shift of other languages of the, so whether the area was pre by someone else, and, and then if it was, then the question is how um, how can this uh, convergence effect be maintained uh, given that there could be some other 
substrate um, effects, even ah. though the shift of, of other populations uh, from whatever to Quechua and Aymar. So yeah. How, how are they still so similar given that they spread? Only? Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, definitely there was a lot of shift to Quechua. So when I say that, uh, when I'm talking about Amazonia and saying there's not much evidence of shift outside the colonially mediated context, the spread of Quechua may be a partial, <coughs> may be partially different. So this is an Andean phenomenon where Quechua spread out enormously through the Inca Empire. However, well, and that process did involve shift. The, the Inca Empire uh, forcibly relocated whole groups of people in order to split up communities. Um, some of the shift undoubtedly happened in that time through those those processes, um, which, however. I would say the difference with the Amazon Basin is that, that those processes involved a top-down state society that was very heavy-handed, which is not what we see, at least in the information we have, for um, the multilingual societies in the Amazon Basin. Um, that said, Bruce Manline's work indicates that a lot of the shift to Quechua has been post-colonial. And that if we go back to the early historical records of the Spanish arrival in the Andes, there's a lot more evidence for a more heterogeneous linguistic picture than we see now. So a lot of that Chevy Quechua has actually postdated um, the colonial arrival and didn't all occur through the dominant the Inca domination itself, although some of it undoubtedly did. Um, and then your other question was if you have all that shift to Quechua, wouldn't that create enough other substrate effects that it would muddy the picture with respect to Aymara. I think that's true to some degree. So for example, Northern Quechua has various structural differences from Southern Quechua that uh, can be attributed to substrate influence probably from Barbacoan and uh, Hibaroan languages in that area. Um, but I, th I think, I'm not a Quechua specialist, but my understanding is that the, the, language still, the languages still retain a structural signal that's very similar to Aymara, and that as you get south into southern Quechua, that signal is even stronger. And of course, there's also evidence of ongoing contact between Quechua and Aymara that's creating further changes in the varieties that are really close to each other. So um, it's complicated and there's lots of questions. But on the whole, um, I, I think that you know, the picture here does support early contact as well. Enormous. 
and recent impacts on the natural society are also enormous. Um, the colonial impact, I think, really can't be underestimated. So, as we mentioned yesterday, we've got waves of epidemics, there would have been enormous demographic change due to disease, and that continued for centuries. So, even now, people talk about whole villages in their memory, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, so much even less, being depopulated by particular diseases that came in. Um, and even now, unfortunately, it's happening. Um, in the mid 18th century, some the historical records indicate that some 20,000 people were taken from the region as slaves. So, a massive depopulation due to disease and slavery. Um, then, in the late 19th century to the 20th century, you had the rubber boom. And other kinds of extractive industries came in, and you know, the rubber boom is, is well known for its toll on the native people. Um, but throughout Amazonia, uh, but other extractivist industries also had similar roles in different regions. Um, so it wasn't strictly rubber, and it wasn't strictly within the period of the rubber boom that these effects occurred. It's been an ongoing phenomenon in many regions, um, and in this region for sure. Um, so, as was the case in Russia and in North America, Canada, the United States, um, you had an enforced boarding school policy that, um, as we'll see, contributed a lot to changes in language use. Um, in this part of the Amazon, it was fairly brief, um, and it didn't affect all groups, but it nevertheless had a pretty radical effect on um, language vitality for some some communities, so a lot of Tucanoa and Tariana communities, for example. Um, they had less effect on Hoop communities and communities of the forest people um, because basically they just had less, the priests were able to have less control over those communities because people were, were more nomadic and lived further away from the rivers. They were harder to get to. When they did take the kids to the boarding schools, the kids just left and got home through the forest. Whereas the um, kids from the river communities, without river transportation, they weren't as, as comfortable trying to make their way on their own. Um, but that, that had a big effect. And then in more recent years, there's a lot of movement towards urban centers, which we see all over the world. So what about the kinds of context scenarios that we have going on here? So, where I said that yesterday that in the indigenous context there doesn't seem to be evidence of lingua francas. Um, in the colonially mediated context, there's all sorts of stuff going on with lingua francas. So I mentioned there's Nigatu, which was this, this form of Tupi Nava, spoken along the coast, that the Europeans uh, took on as their primary indigenous contact language for a period of time, uh, particularly in the early, early colonial period. And, brought it into various parts of the Amazon basin. And in the Negro region, especially in the middle and lower Negro region, many communities ended up switching to Nino Um <clears throat> In the Valpez region, Tucano has become dominant as a lingua franca um, over the past 50 to 75 years. Um, and of course, Portuguese and Spanish have a role as a lingua franca, as you might imagine. Um, what about language endangerment and, and shift? Uh, definitely the colonial dominant, colonially dominant languages have been um, the targets of shift throughout this region. So interestingly, there's something of a stepping stone model so that in many cases you have shift of local indigenous languages to one other indigenous language that's become colonially dominant or dominant through the colonial structure and from there to Spanish or Portuguese. So, um, for example, in the case of the Valle, these are Arawakan speakers, the language appears to not be completely extinct. Um, they switched to Niga too in the colonial context, and now most of those speakers have switched to Portuguese. Um, so Niga too is not, it's, it's itself an native language of the region. Tariana speakers have mostly shifted to Tucano, and from there many of them have shifted to Here's a, a, um, a translation from a um, text published by Eichenwald uh, from Tariana speakers, where um, one of the Tariana speakers that she worked with accounts how the boarding school context led to the endangerment of Tariana. And she, the, the 
the man who's speaking, Rasilio Brizzo, talks about how they were taken together and put in these boarding schools run by these uh, Catholic priests, um, and how these boarding schools brought together kids from all different ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. Um, and then he says, well, so we just used to speak to Kano. Um, from what I've understood from speaking with other people and reading other material, um, part of the reason for this was that they were actually pushed more to speak Portuguese, but they were also pushed into a, a more of a monolingual mold. Um, and when they were on their own, they would just converge to Tucano because they were brought from so many different parts of the region that they didn't necessarily, and these were kids, so they didn't necessarily all have competence in all of the languages. So they would converge on the one that was most regionally dominant, or in other words, most regionally prevalent at that time. So the majority of the kids would be Tucano speakers uh, because that was related to the regional distribution of languages, and they converged on Tucano um, and also learned Portuguese. And then they went back to their communities and weren't fully competent or comfortable in the community language. And because of the language norms of the region, if you speak a language, you're expected to speak it properly. You're, not, you're expected not to mix with other languages, not to mess up. And so that apparently created additional pressure on those kids, uh, meaning that they ended up not speaking the language. Um, and then there were other factors as well. So, you know, men would go to the rubber extractivist uh, camps to, to work with rubber, and communities would have a low male presence. Of course, if these are communities where all of the women are married in from other language communities, then their languages would end up becoming more dominant. So, the whole combination of factors, but the boarding schools is a big part of it. So, <coughs> In the contemporary context, this work by um, Luke Fleming and Sarah Schulis that looks at language choices among Tucanoan people in San Gabriel de Cachoeira, which is the Brazilian town, the dominant Brazilian town in the region. So as I said, there's been a lot of movement for the urban centers. And now what you see is, it's an interesting, it looks like an interesting kind of, there's an interesting parallels to the, the language choices of Hoop speakers that I talked about yesterday who will go, for example, to a Tucano, Tucano village and not want to speak any who, only speak Tucano. There are interesting parallels between that and the behavior of Tucanoan people in the city who are now switching to Portuguese. So in some of the cases that, that are uh, related in, in work by Fleming and Schulis, um, there are various accounts of people who will speak Portuguese but refuse to speak Tucano much like the hoop speakers who refuse to speak hoop while in the Tukanoi community. So there's some interesting distinctions between local language use and colonial, colonially mediated language use, but there's also some interesting points of continuity, I would say. Um, another area where we see some differences relates to um, utterance internal code switching. Um, so this is a text uh, where a man who's actually based Sano, but is fluent in Tucano, which because it's the regional Nipo Franca, is he's used as Tucano with the Hoop communities in the area. Um, and as a regional health authority, he was speaking to a group of Hoop speakers in a community. Um, but the interesting thing here is that he's switching back and forth between Tucano and Portuguese all the time. So as I mentioned yesterday, you don't get this kind of intrasentential code switching among local indigenous languages, but with Portuguese, it appears to be completely fine. And I've heard people on the streets of São Gabriel doing the same thing. Um, some of the context here certainly has to do with non-indigenous ideas and notions and, and terms, um, which you might imagine may be relevant in triggering some of the switches. But there are many, most of these, these words and phrases, there's a way to say them in Tucano, and that if people wanted to say them in Tucano, they would say them in Tucano. It's not that you can't express them. You might have a few loans from Portuguese, but um, there's a great deal more code switching in here than um, is necessitated by, by the languages themselves. Um, so uh, I can maybe play this if we have. I can get this to work. Maybe just hear it. 
lot of things. Um, and here's another example. This is also an interesting example because, um, as I mentioned before, hardly any of people speak Portuguese. Um, so it, the, the switching with Portuguese in the context of of spe speeches to hoop communities is interesting because it's probably not done in an effort to be uh, fully communicated. So in the case of Marcelino's speech, if he stuck completely to Tupano, it's guaranteed that people would understand him better than when he's switching back and forth. And in this case, this is a particularly interesting example. This is one of the only hoop speakers who is confident in Portuguese that I know. Um, and in his speech to the community, he will also mix in bits and pieces of Portuguese, not to the same extent as Marcelino, but bits and pieces. And it's an interesting observation is that um, this mixing, in, in the context that I've observed, the mixing seems to be particularly prevalent when people are speaking publicly. And I think it indexes, my, my assumption would be that it indicates, it indexes that kind of um, social authority that's relevant to this context of speaking publicly, especially about things like um, local health infrastructure and schools that are topics that are outside the indigenous context as well. So there's, um, there's interesting stuff going on here in, in many respects, but one basic point is that you get code switching between indigenous languages and Portuguese that you just don't see, or I have not seen and I haven't heard of, um, related to indigenous languages. Um, so why is it that you have different rules associated with these different languages, even by the same people, in the same context? Well, Portuguese certainly has a different social role in the region. It's a language of prestige. It indexes this engagement with a non-indigenous society that is associated with authority and prestige as well. Um, it's also neutral with respect to the indigenous regional system. So the kinds of forces that are encouraging people to be selected and their language choice within the indigenous system arguably aren't relevant, when, or not, not as relevant when Portuguese comes in. Um, okay, so we've seen differences in terms of liberal promptness, language shift, code switching with, with respect to um, colonially mediated languages and local indigenous languages. We also see differences with respect to lexical borrowing. So um, here's a couple of graphs of sources of loans in a variety of languages. In both of these cases, there's pretty limited confidence, actually, in, um, among, at least to some degree, among um, speakers in Portuguese, and yet there are, in many cases, a lot of European loans coming in. Certainly, um, disproportionate number of European loans compared to um, in loans in the local indigenous languages, given the long-term and intense contact that's applied with the local indigenous languages. Um, so quite high. Also, in contrast to what we saw yesterday in Valpez languages, um, what in more in keeping with cross-linguistic predictions about contact, we get more nouns being borrowed than verbs from Portuguese. Whereas, as we saw with who, for example, in Tucano, it's the other way around. Um, what about contact influence and grammatical structure? Well. So again, in contrast to what we saw in among the indigenous languages where lexical borrowing is low but grammatical diffusion is high, here it's the other way around. Lexical borrowing is high from Portuguese relatively, but grammatical, grammatical changes relating to language projects seem to be quite low. There are a few examples. So uh, here's this K uh, adverbial that, that was brought up uh, in the last class that seems to be a Portuguese loan. And there's a kind of adverbial clause construction that seems to be um, new that is associated with this model. But it's more that what you have is loan words coming in and structures that are kind of piggybacking on the loans, I would argue. So similarly, the Portuguese disjunctive connector, O, um, is associated with a new form of disjunction that wasn't present. Um, as far as substrate, uh, as far as effects on the regional indigenous Portuguese, um, and then you got to there's some evidence of substrate effects, which you might predict. So one of the interesting examples is um, this kind of semi-grammaticalized evidential 
instruction in regional Portuguese where you have gisco, meaning literally meaning say that, but used in a way that would not be grammatical in standard Portuguese. So it's essentially taken on a, um, a role as a recorded evidential marker in regional varieties of Portuguese and appears, appears to be very clearly a subject effect in local Portuguese. <coughs> So um, just summarizing what I've talked about here, um, we see really pretty big differences in terms of the effects of language contact involving local indigenous languages and involving the colonially mediated languages um, relating to lingua francas, relating to shift, relating to code switching, lexical borrowing, and structural borrowing. Things seem to work quite differently, although as I pointed out, there are some interesting points of continuity as well relating to language choice. So I would argue here that you've got different linguistic ecologies that are associated with different um, historical and social contexts, and the contact outcomes are very different. So we can't just say, oh, people in this region don't borrow lexicon. It's more complex than that. We have to be very careful about um, making <coughs> interpolations about contact uh, outcomes without thinking about the, the social and linguistic contexts that are involved that are related to those outcomes. And I would say that there's plenty of evidence that processes like this apply in other places. So when Nina was talking about yesterday with Dagestan, um, certainly the, the fact that language shift is and language endangerment is everywhere nowadays. It's a process that just seems to be accelerating all the time. Um, where even in regions like the Balkans, where traditionally you had a lot of maintenance, um, lingua francas, the arrival of uh, development of new mixed languages, um, different code switching patterns. So uh, Jeff Good's work in the Cameroon grass fields also talks about how you don't get much code switching among the local languages, but you do get it with Cameroonian pidgin. So not unlike what we saw with Bafes Portuguese. So if we come back to the schema from Enfield's diagram, um, I think we can schematize this kind of process as well, where you might argue that there's a kind of social identification with um, the use of another language that then drives processes of language shift. So just to summarize, um, it's important I think to think about the variations that we see across different regions and across different time periods and um, associated with that across different social and cultural contexts and how these in some cases can translate into very different patterns of language contact and very different kinds of contact outcomes. In other cases, similar contact outcomes that may in fact be rooted in somewhat different processes. So I think it's important to think about both of those angles. Um, and the things that I've highlighted here have to do with um, perceptions of uh, linguistic and social solidarity and difference and how those relate to each other and how those can be anchored in very culturally specific understandings of language and identity. So for example, in the Amazon, the things that I talked about yesterday were relating to perceptions of group and how language is related to that, versus in Cameroon, for example, where people are shifting languages to show different social affiliations. Um, and of course, things like the quantity and quality of interaction, of course, are relevant, as everybody's recognized for a long time. Um, network density and scope, Prior linguistic landscape, so I, I made the point that maybe the phenomena in Vanuatu and the Amazon are not so different, but it has to do with whether you have a lot of salient linguistic differences already in place at some point in time when these processes are, are getting going versus a much more similar linguistic landscape. And that's that. This is a jaguar with <laughs> Okay, so I guess it's just a couple minutes for questions. If anybody has anything. Yes. Uh, so, in the Gertrude's piece that you showed, uh, they say some things in Portuguese that are not quite grammatical. So, uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, English call a uh hat -huh, or a uh, complicated thing that a uh hat -huh, or a hat or a hat or a hat or a hat or a hat.
some kind of internal calcing as well. And some of it may also just be um, a kind of adaptation of the Portuguese to fit the structure of the group utterance mm -hmm. in the more in general. But yeah. Uh, today, there is one question, sorry. Uh, uh, Kate Bellamy was seriously to make a uh, uh, present in Moscow, uh, and she also made a similar claim with the general debate about Amazonia, about the low level of lexical influence, of lexical uh, exchange between uh, local languages uh, with the presence of really fresh influence from Portuguese or Spanish from European languages. So, my question is very simple how do we know that there were, were no more local? Uh, borrowings which had been then ousted by Portuguese and Spanish, so we simply did not see them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I guess on some level we don't know. Um, but on the other hand, uh, certainly a lot of the loans that are coming in are nouns relating to um, things like material objects or concepts that wouldn't have been present in the non-indigenous environment. So in that case, it seems pretty clear these are need-based borrowings. There's not a particular constraint against borrowing. It's easy to borrow it, so you just do it. Um, and the concept was there previously. Um, I would say the majority are can be explained that way. Um, but in certain cases, uh, yeah, there's probably no way to know for sure. Um, but I guess, I guess unless you could argue that there's, there was a need-based borrowing previously for the same concepts that would have uh, brought in an indigenous word, then um, we would expect the distribution of words to be pretty, um, to be more distributed around the lexicon, that the things who were ousted would also be represented by borrowings in the lexicon that weren't ousted. And, and not yeah, but what, what, what you mean, usually when you consider places if, if we limit ourselves to core vocabulary, which is some kind of essential core vocabulary, uh, then you will expect both local loans and Portuguese loans somewhere at the periphery of this core vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So they would have been to occupy the same place. Of course, not for artifacts. Artifacts is a different story. But I don't think that you're making claims only about artifacts, uh, uh, right. cultural borrowings, but about right. more generally about core borrowings also in terms of customers. Right. Well, a good example would be. Um, you don't get you don't get much borrowed with any kind of basic vocabulary from any language. So I don't think there's a lot of replacement of basic vocabulary with Portuguese loans in the languages that I've looked at. Um, but you do get a lot of of uh, or you get more indigenous borrowings in, for example, flora and fauna, and those are not ousted by by colonial languages. Um, in many cases, there's no. I mean, Again, you can make certain arguments on the basis of need, and that there's, there aren't a lot of words from the colonial languages um, or a lot of flora and fauna anyway. Um, but I think in certain cultural domains, you see, um, you see uh, opportunity where Portuguese loans might have come in and replaced a lot of local loans and it's not happening. Um, and then in other cultural domains, there probably wasn't much room for local words anyway, you get more of Portuguese overlay. But what you do see more of, for example, is, um, for example, if you look, so for example, in none of the languages, if you look at um, agricultural terminology, which seems to be pretty innovative, um, which you know supports the idea that these people had a hunter-gatherer orientation for a long period of time, um, you do see some loans in the agricultural vocabulary from Tucano and Arawak, but you also see a lot of native innovation. Whereas if you look at, so that suggests that, that a lot of the concepts came in and were new. There was some need based borrowing from Tucano and Arawak for those concepts, but there's also um, a lot of, of native innovation to come up with words for those new concepts. Whereas in, the, um, in other domains, it seems like you do get some native innovation, but you also get you know, arguably more Portuguese lines. Um, I don't know, I think there are a lot of questions here about um, you know, if we restrict ourselves to particular domains and think about the role of need-based borrowing versus other motivations, that certainly accounts for some of the differences that we see. Um, but it seems to me that maybe it doesn't account for